research happening in this building on how to make renewable energies more efficient, on helping power grids assimilate energy research on air and sea transport and much, much more besides, will undoubtedly help lead Scotland and the whole world into the net zero age. The vital necessity of making that transition quickly and also fairly must be the message and drive the outcome of the 26th Conference of the Parties to the United Nations Framework on Climate, or COP26, as it is more commonly known. Uh, over the past 20 months, as the world has faced the very hard reality of a global pandemic, it might at times have seemed that the threat of the global climate crisis has receded, but it hasn't. If anything, that threat has intensified. And so the time really is now to use the lessons of tackling a pandemic to speed up our efforts to save the planet. Science, collaboration, action across our societies have helped us manage COVID, although not as evenly across the globe as should be the case. Getting people in all parts of the world vaccinated quickly is a challenge indeed. I think it's a moral responsibility that developed countries must step up and meet. But there's no doubt at all that the speed with which vaccines were developed almost from a standing start, as just one example of our response to COVID, has been testament to human ingenuity. So we must now bring that same urgency, immediacy and creativity to meeting head on the climate crisis. And so today I want to set out what, in my view, this COP26 summit must achieve in terms of hard commitments on reducing emissions and on climate finance, and also crucially on promoting both international and intergenerational fairness. I'll then talk about the part Scotland will seek to play during COP itself by encouraging dialogue and bridging what has been called the climate gap in perspectives on climate change. And I will end by reflecting on the importance of Scotland truly leading by example, leading in actions, not just in words, and also doing so on some of the more difficult decisions countries like ours face in making that transition to a net zero future. So first and foremost, what must COP26 achieve? Above all, it must secure commitments to emission reductions that are capable of limiting global warming to 1.5 degrees. At the very least, it must achieve near-term commitments that keep that objective well and truly alive in the longer term. The recent report of the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change couldn't have been clearer about the necessity of this. Compared to pre-industrial times, global temperatures have already risen by more than one degree on average. The impacts of this are no longer distant or theoretical. They are being experienced by many people across the world right now. Just this year, wildfires in Greece, massive flooding in Nigeria and Uganda, a food crisis in Madagascar. And of course, we won't escape the impacts here in our own country. Of course, and this is an important point I think we all need to recognise, limiting warming to 1.5 degrees won't prevent all of the impacts of climate change. It's probably already too late to do that. But every fraction of a degree above that intensifies the catastrophic nature of what we face. If we allow that to happen, we do risk life on this planet becoming unrecognisable. And every single leader, without exception, gathering in Glasgow next week knows that. No one can pretend otherwise. And each and every country gathered round the negotiating table also knows the action that is needed to prevent it. So there is no excuse for failing to act. Despite this, though, the world is not yet meeting the challenge. It isn't even yet coming close to doing that. As the UN Secretary General made clear last month, the definite promises made by member states at that stage, assuming that they were all delivered, were sufficient only to keep temperature increases 
to 2.7 degrees. He said that would create a hellscape on Earth. Since then, of course, more pledges have been made to reduce emissions, and that process will no doubt continue in the days ahead as we approach the start of COP. That is welcome. There's been progress in other areas too, such as stopping the international financing of coal-powered projects. But it isn't yet nearly enough to keep global warming to two degrees, let alone 1.5. So much more is needed. I think small countries like ours can lead the way, and I'll talk shortly about what we in Scotland are doing and what more we need to do. But in the coming days, the countries that emit the most need to step up the most to this challenge. They must commit to significant cuts in emissions by 2030, which is crucial to keeping that ambition of 1.5 degrees alive and be clear in their determination to achieve net zero. And to be credible, their pledges must be backed by action. The hard fact is this, keeping 1.5 alive, which has become the strapline almost for COP26, is vital. But it mustn't just become a face-saving slogan. It must be real. And so both in the run-up to and at COP itself, there needs to be a significant uplift in ambition from the world's biggest emitting countries to make that real. The summit must deliver real progress in other areas too. Climate finance is key. 12 years ago in Copenhagen, developed countries promised $100 billion of climate finance every year from 2020. In Paris, that promise was repeated. Here in Glasgow, that promise must be delivered. And the money must go where it is needed most. It must help the countries and communities now facing the worst impacts of climate change tackle the causes of it and also adapt to its consequences. And it must be made available in a way that doesn't load these countries with unsustainable debt. Delivering on a 12-year-old promise is quite simply the right thing to do. Failure to do so would be unconscionable. And of course, it is essential to the building of good faith between developed and developing countries. I also believe, though, that this COP needs to recognise much more fully the fundamental issues of fairness and justice that lie at the heart of the climate crisis. I mentioned Scotland's industrial past earlier. That is a source of pride to us, but it should also be a real cause for reflection. For a very, very long time, we have enjoyed all of the material benefits of the carbon emissions that are causing climate change. And like so many other developed nations, we have benefited much more than those countries that are now facing and experiencing the worst impacts of the climate crisis. So delivering on the $100 billion a year commitment is a necessary first step that developed countries must take towards addressing climate injustice. But we need to do more than that. Most effort in developed countries is currently on mitigation, on averting the worst impacts of the crisis. Increasingly and importantly, there is now a focus on adaptation too, on ensuring that we can live with the changes that are inevitably to come. But there's also a need to address the loss and the damage that has been and is being suffered already by communities around the world due to drought, floods, desertification, loss of life and population displacement. Here, as in other areas, Scotland is seeking to lead by example. Our Climate Justice Fund was the first in the world. We have recently taken the decision to double the value of that, and we're determined that it will help address loss and damage. Of course, I recognise that in a global context, our fund is very small, but it is nevertheless important, and through it, we are acknowledging head on these fundamental issues of international fairness. Loss and damage is being discussed in the second week of the COP summit, and that is welcome, but it can't simply be discussed. We must see progress. I know this is something I'll be following closely during the summit. This could be the first ever COP that sees the world take this issue seriously, and I hope it lives up to that responsibility. There is also, of course, an intergenerational injustice at the heart of the climate crisis too. I'm acutely aware that all of you here, students, youth parliamentarians, 
will live your lives with the climate that my and preceding generations have created. All leaders at COP need to truly understand the concern, the entirely justified anger that so many of you, so many young people across the world feel. Indeed, I know that in some ways what COP represents, rich countries coming together to haggle and negotiate over the future of the planet, might intensify rather than alleviate your anger. On the need for climate action, there is no doubt at all that your generation is far ahead of mine. I know that some of the most challenging interactions I've had on climate policy have been with young activists. I've been pushed to go much further and faster, and rightly so. So for all of us in positions of leadership today, there is a really important standard that we must hold ourselves to. Can we look you and your peers across the world in the eye and say that we are doing enough? Right now, the simple answer to that question is no, we're not. So a fundamental test of success for COP26 is that it starts to turn that no into yes. So my pledge today is that the Scottish Government will do everything and anything we can to ensure that COP26 is a success. We won't be at the negotiating table directly. We're not an independent state, not yet. But as host country, we do have a big role to play and we also carry a big and very serious responsibility. I made clear to both the UN and the UK government that we stand ready and willing to do anything and everything we can to support the negotiations. The UK's presidency of COP26 is a massive opportunity, but also a serious responsibility. I know that the Prime Minister and the UK government are determined to step up in the days ahead and show real commitment and leadership. And the Scottish Government will do everything we can to help. After all, this summit will shape the future of the world we live in. So absolutely nothing, certainly not party politics, should stand in the way of us working together towards a successful outcome. One of Scotland's objectives during the summit itself is to be a bridge builder, to connect those whose voices are too rarely heard with those making the decisions. I quoted Antonio Guterres, the UN Secretary General, earlier. In the same speech that I quoted, he talked about the need to bridge the climate divide. And so part of our role at this COP will be to provide the spaces and forums and support the initiatives that will allow these bridges to be built. Firstly, between the developed and developing worlds. We have supported the Glasgow Climate Dialogues, which facilitate discussion between the global south and the developed world, and also the Global Citizens Assembly to give people from around the world the opportunity to be heard on climate action. Second, between young people and the leaders whose decisions will shape your future. The Scottish Government has funded the Conference of Youth, which starts on Thursday. That will be the first major in-person event of COP26. More than 400 young people from more than 120 countries will gather to draw up their demands of world leaders. Uh, I will speak at the opening event, but more importantly, I will listen. I've also made a commitment to meet regularly throughout COP with v Vanessa Nakati from Uganda. Vanessa is the founder of Youth for the Future Africa and the Africa-based Rise Up movement. Hearing her perspective at key stages over the two weeks will, I think, be an important reality check. And thirdly, we will be seeking to build a bridge between the UN member states in the negotiating room and the governments of cities, regions and devolved nations like ours. Scotland is currently the European co-chair of what's called the Under Two Coalition. That is a powerful alliance of city, regional and devolved governments from around the world. Collectively, we represent almost 2 billion people and around half of the reduction in emissions necessary to meet the challenge of 1.5 degrees will depend on decisions taken by governments like ours. So we carry a great deal of responsibility, but also a great deal of influence. We intend to use that to the full during COP. 
Today, a new just transition alliance is being established within the coalition to ensure that all member governments can access the resources, support and information necessary to deliver just transitions. And last week, the coalition agreed a new memorandum of understanding. It commits us collectively to reach net zero by 2050 at the latest and to do so individually as fast as possible. Scotland, of course, is legally committed to doing so by 2045. Along with my fellow co-chairs from California, Korea, Mexico and South Africa, I'll be working during and after COP to increase support for those commitments. The focus at COP will inevitably be on the negotiations between the big countries, but governments at all levels have a responsibility and Scotland is determined to play our full part. Of course, our ability to do that depends on our own climate credibility. Scotland cannot urge other countries to set and meet ambitious targets if we fail to do that ourselves. We must lead not by the strength of our rhetoric, but by the power of our example. And so that's the final issue I want to focus on today. In most comparisons of international climate targets, Scotland does rank very well indeed. Uh, the UK Committee on Climate Change confirmed just last year that we have decarbonised more quickly than any G20 nation. We've already halved our emissions since 1990. We're committed to a 75% reduction by 2030, which means halving them again over the course of this decade. And, of course, we aim to reach net zero and therefore completely end Scotland's contribution to climate change by 2045 at the latest. Our targets are not just amongst the most ambitious anywhere in the world, they are also amongst the toughest. For instance, we're one of very few countries to have legally binding annual targets for every year of our journey to net zero. We're also one of only a few to include shipping and aviation in the calculation of our emissions. And we have pledged to meet our targets through domestic effort, not by reliance on international credit trading. So we here have much to be proud of, but still we need to do much better. It's not enough to set tough targets. We must meet those targets. And despite all of our progress, we have fallen short on our last three annual milestones. Two years ago, our emissions were 51.5% lower than in 1990. But to meet that year's annual target, they needed to be 55% lower. The law in Scotland stipulates that if we miss any annual targets, we must outperform in future years to make up for it. So this week we will publish a catch-up plan. It will highlight some of the actions already announced this year and also set out a range of additional measures, for example, to decarbonise public sector buildings, promote home upgrades and make bus travel cleaner and more accessible. Many of these measures were committed to in the cooperation agreement uh, between the Scottish Government and the Scottish Green Party, an agreement which explicitly and rightly places climate policy at the heart of everything we do. And over the next three weeks, we will highlight other aspects of the work the Scottish Government is doing to put the climate front and centre. That will include planning policy, agriculture, nature restoration, wave and tidal power and green hydrogen. In all of these, we are stepping up our ambition and our action. For example, there is a licensing round underway right now for up to 10 gigawatts of offshore wind power. And later this week, we will set out plans to further increase our onshore wind capacity. We will also talk, as we need to do, about the future of our oil and gas industry. And I want to address that issue now, since it's one, rightly, that the Scottish Government is often challenged on. Before I do so though, I want to reflect briefly on the UK Government's decision last week not to give priority support to an important part of Scotland's planned journey to net zero. The Scottish Government supports the Scottish cluster of proposed projects for carbon capture and storage or CCS. The cluster includes the ACORN project in Aberdeenshire which recently bid for support and funding. Despite the fact that ACORN was considered the most advanced of the projects bidding to be taken forward, it was passed over. I find that decision inexplicable on any objective grounds. 
Acorn is the lowest cost and most deliverable planned CCS project anywhere in the UK. And the Scottish cluster would support approximately 15,000 jobs over the next three decades or so, many of them in the North East and around Grangemouth, which of course are currently highly dependent on high carbon industries. It could also have stored up to five to six million tonnes of carbon dioxide a year by 2030, approximately 10% of Scotland's current emissions, and up to 20 million tonnes by around 2040. Now, I know, and it's important to recognise this, that there is a fear, and I understand that fear, that carbon capture and storage will simply be used to justify the unsustainable extraction of more and more fossil fuels. Uh, and that must not be the case. But it is a vital part of meeting our climate targets. That's why the Scottish Government made clear that we would support the project and why, in my view, last week's decision must be revisited. The fact is, CCS can help reduce emissions and capture carbon where we have no alternatives. But it does not, must not mean that fossil fuel extraction in Scotland can continue without limit. Because, and this is the fundamental point, there must be a transition away from dependence on oil and gas. The question all countries face is how fast that will be. And for countries like Scotland, with a significant and long established oil and gas industry, this is undoubtedly one of the most difficult issues we face as we tackle the climate emergency. Tens of thousands of jobs are dependent currently on oil and gas production. Those jobs and the people in them matter. And of course, much of our energy use is still catered for by oil and gas. So for countries like ours, with significant remaining reserves of oil and gas, it is tempting to tell ourselves that for both economic and energy reasons, we must keep exploring for and extracting oil and gas until the last possible moment. That, in my view, would be fundamentally wrong. That approach would lead only to a vicious cycle of inaction and missed opportunity. The more we tell ourselves that we will always have oil and gas as a safety net, the less motivated we will be to speed up the development of alternatives, to train people for new jobs in emerging technologies, and to deliver the just transition we and the world needs. It's an approach that cannot be justified in the face of the climate emergency, but it cannot be justified economically either. In Scotland, we already have a highly advanced renewable energy industry. Nearly 100% of our net electricity demand already comes from renewable sources. Put simply, we are one of the countries with the greatest capacity to make the transition away from fossil fuels and to reap the economic benefits of doing so. So it is vital that we accelerate the development of alternative sources of energy. We must do so, of course, to reduce reliance on an unsustainable source of energy, but also to seize the economic opportunities that the transition offers us. This need to face up to the climate emergency and speed up the transition is why, for example, we believe that the proposed Campbell development must be reassessed. The International Energy Agency is even blunter. In its assessment, there should be no new oil and gas fields approved anywhere. Not everyone will agree with that, of course, but the necessity of accelerating the transition away from fossil fuels could not be clearer. As part of that, we must accept, as our cooperation agreement already does, that the continued unlimited recovery of hydrocarbons is not consistent with meeting the aims of the Paris Agreement. And nor, in my view, is it consistent with maximising the economic benefits of the transition to renewable and low carbon sources of energy. To support our transition domestically, the Scottish Government will publish a new energy strategy next year. The principle underpinning it will be the one already encapsulated in the cooperation agreement. The unlimited extraction of fossil fuels or maximum economic recovery in UK policy terms is not consistent with our climate obligations. Instead, our focus will be on achieving the fastest possible just transition for the oil and gas sector, one that delivers jobs and economic benefit, ensures our energy security and meets our climate obligations. Arguably, there is no country in the world better placed in Scotland to maximise the benefit of that transition. To inform the strategy, we will carry out an analysis of Scotland's energy requirements as we move to net zero. This will help us determine how the sector can help deliver 
our contribution to the Paris targets and how meeting our own energy needs can help build a new low emission energy industry. And absolutely central to our work will be protecting and supporting those who currently work in oil and gas. As part of the new strategy, we are developing a just transition plan for the energy sector with a particular focus on the northeast of Scotland and already backed by £500 million. In many areas, offshore wind, green hydrogen are good examples of this. The skills that oil and gas workers currently have are hugely valuable and eminently transferable. In fact, many leading employers in the oil and gas industry are already investing in some of the opportunities the transition will bring. So we will help workers take advantage of these opportunities, which is a fundamental part of ensuring that Scotland's transition to net zero is a fair one. In a building like this one, with so much astonishing research being carried out, it is clear how many opportunities for both economic and environmental progress the transition to net zero can bring. But we must recognise that these opportunities won't always be so obvious to those whose current jobs feel threatened, uh, which is why in Scotland our just transition will put fairness for workers and communities front and centre. And that focus on justice and fairness will be central to Scotland's whole approach to COP26. We will seek to set a strong example in our domestic actions, even where the decisions around that are difficult, uh, as the decisions on oil and gas undoubtedly are. We will do everything we can to support an outcome that will keep alive the imperative of limiting global warming to 1.5 degrees and which also recognises the vital importance of climate justice. We will use our position as the host country to create spaces and dialogues which encourage empathy, promote understanding and help people share perspectives. We will encourage national governments to match the ambition of cities, regions and state governments. We will help those around the negotiating table listen to activists in the developed world and from the global south and we will work to ensure that leaders of my generation understand that failure to act now would be a betrayal of young people right around the world. If Scotland can successfully play that role in bridging these gaps in understanding and experience, we will, I think, massively increase the chances of COP26 being the success that we need it to be. And we will ensure that the urgency used in tackling the COVID crisis is finally brought to bear in tackling the climate crisis. Uh, there is a lot at stake in our city over the next three weeks. There is no doubt about that. This may well be the world's best, but also possibly its last opportunity to avert climate catastrophe. But if that opportunity is taken, the benefits will be plentiful. So this is a moment for hope, but above all, a moment for delivery, for turning promises into actions. And for Glasgow, at this great city that helped lead the world into the industrial age, it is an opportunity in this new era to help power the planet towards net zero. The Scottish Government, as I hope I have uh, indicated today, will do all and everything we can to help bring that about, because there is no doubt whatsoever that the future of our planet demands it. Thank you very much indeed. Thank you very much. First Minister. Now everyone, the First Minister is going to take some questions and I'm really pleased that she has the time to do this today. We did canvas for questions in advance and we have many, many questions, but we're not going to be able to take them all this morning. But I want to reassure everyone that any question that has been submitted, the Scottish Government will be providing you with an answer. So what I'm going to do now in a moment is call on individuals who've selected a random group of questions. And if you would hold on to wait for the roving mic to reach you, and then we'll ask you to ask your question. So the first question is from Sagarika Oja, one of our own Strathclyde University students. Sagarika, are you here? Ah, here she is in the front row. Great, thank you. Thank you uh, very much. It's a really good question. I, I reflected in my speech that uh, we are effectively, as a country, halfway to net zero 
we've, we've halved our emissions from the, the 1990 baseline. Um, and some of what we have done to achieve that has been difficult, but relatively easy compared to the policies we need to implement to get the next half of the way there. So over the first half of the journey, we have decarbonised almost completely our electricity uh, supply. Uh, about 97% of all of the electricity we use in Scotland comes from renewable sources. So that is a massive achievement. It hasn't been easy to do, but compared to what we need to do now, uh, it has been relatively easy. So the policies now uh, centre on uh, the other areas uh, that account for most of our emissions. Uh, so how we heat our homes um, is a crucial area. We uh, just uh, recently in the last couple of weeks set out uh, a plan to decarbonise the heating of homes and, and other buildings. Uh, that uh, will be backed by significant investment over the next few years and uh, will be difficult to do but essential. Uh, we also need to decarbonise our transport sector. So we have uh, very ambitious targets to phase out the use of petrol and diesel cars uh, between now and the end of this decade uh, and to make much more use of electric vehicles and low carbon uh, emission uh, vehicles as well. Bus travel, uh, extending free bus travel to young people, for example, is a key part of supporting public transport. And then areas like agriculture, uh, which are, are big emitters as well, working with the agriculture sector, a very important part of Scotland's economy, uh, to make sure that we are making the changes there that lower emissions. So all of that is important. So too is uh, increasing the role of nature-based solutions, planting more trees, restoring more peatlands, uh, the things that we know help naturally store carbon. All of that is essential if we are to meet those targets of uh, net zero by 2045, which is obviously the, the key target. In my view, though, uh, the more important one, because it is closer, is the 75% reduction by 2030. 2030 is not that far away, so we need to focus on all of these things to make sure we get there. Thank you very much. So the next question is from Simon Anderson, Chair of Scotland's International Development Alliance. Is Simon here? Simon. Thank you. <laughs> yeah, so thank you very much, First, First Minister, for that precedent-setting um, speech. I was fortunate enough to work with some of your officials on the Glasgow Climate Dialogues. In fact, I co coordinated the loss and damage part of that. And so particularly pleased to hear the commitment that has been made to pivot some of the Climate Justice Fund towards loss and damage. This indeed sets a precedent. I think people here in this room are very <laughs> fortunate to be here to hear you make that commitment because it is a world first. What can we now do and what can Scotland do really to push forward commitments from other Annex 1 and Annex 2 countries under the UNFCCC? to really address loss and damage as it, as it is stated in Article 8? I, I think it is one of the most important strands uh, of what I hope will happen at COP here over the next uh, couple of weeks. Uh, what can we do? Uh, firstly, we have to lead, as I said, by actions, not just by words. When we established the Climate Justice Fund, it was the first in the world at that time. I'm always conscious that Given that Scotland is a relatively small country, anything, any money we dedicate to a climate justice fund is, is relatively small in a global context. The money is important though, but in a sense the example it sets is even more important. Explicitly talking about loss and damage and making a commitment to, to use your term, pivot some of that support uh, to addressing that is also an important way in which we're leading by example. Making sure that we do everything we can uh, to amplify and support the voices uh, of countries that have done the least to cause this crisis but are dealing most already uh, with the impact of it uh, is another important part of what we can do during COP uh, and after COP. Uh, as you know, loss and damage will be discussed in the second week of the event. Um, but what I will be looking for and, and what I certainly will uh, you know, take the opportunity to comment on during uh, the course of COP is what that is actually adding up to in the commitments that are made and the seriousness with which that is tackled. Um, I think there's a, a big opportunity here, more than 
at any COP in the past, although it was obviously a, a feature of, of Paris and the Paris outcome, is to make sure the voices from uh, the developing world, from the global south, are, are heard, and not just heard, but listened to, and that the experiences are reflected in the outcomes. I don't underestimate the challenge of all of that, but I think it is one example where, albeit a small country, not directly at the negotiating table, can have a big impact on steering uh, the, the content of the discussions and hopefully the outcome of them as well. Thank you very much. Thank you. I now invite Victory Ekpe Kurede, of a member of the Scottish Youth Parliament, to ask her question. Victory is here, over here. Thank you. Hello, um, I'm Victoria Pecorede and I'm the member of the Scottish Youth Parliament representing East Kilbride. We are delighted to see the Scottish Government commit to providing free bus travel for all young people under 22. However, we are concerned that um, young people from island communities will not benefit from this due to the lack of bus services and the cost of inter-island ferries. What is the Scottish, Scottish Government doing to address this concern? So it's a good question. I think it's one we need to continue to uh, reflect on and think about how we ensure that policies we introduce, which obviously benefit people across the, the, the central belt of our country, also benefit people living in the more remote, remote parts of our country and specifically in island communities. Uh, in, in terms of the free bus travel policy, our, our current concessionary uh, fare scheme for young people has as part of it um, a, a guaranteed number of uh, free ferry journeys uh, a year for young people. So there's a precedent there that we have to consider, uh, you know, including in policies as we go forward. But we're also working hard to try to reduce ferry fares for everybody. So uh, we've done that quite significantly already in recent years through road equivalent tariff uh, schemes. Uh, we have a, a fair fares uh, review at the moment, which we hope will allow us to take further action there. But I think there's a more general point that you're raising. I, I know you're raising it specifically in relation to bus travel, which is very important. But generally, uh, we need to always be asking ourselves if the policies we introduce take proper account of the experience of life for people in rural and remote and island uh, communities across the country. We now have a policy of island proofing all of our policies to try to bring that about. So it's something I can assure you. Uh, we won't always get it right because yeah, we're not perfect, but we are absolutely determined to making sure that that is mainstreamed into all of our policy thinking and all of our policy making. Thank you very much. So the next question is from Aswad Chowdhury of the Scotland's Climate Assembly. Is Aswad here? Just here. We're just waiting for the, uh, the mic to come to you. Thank you very much, uh, First Minister. So uh, I'm actually a member of the Scottish Climate Assembly, and uh, so my question is regarding public transport introduction of integrated ticketing system. So I know that delegates from COP26 have been given access to free public transport in Glasgow during the conference with the use of an integrated travel card that can be used in all public transport, but however, the general public won't be able to. So one of our recommendations was that an Oyster card for Scotland is introduced for a national integrated public transport system. We also recommend that public transport be made cheaper or free. This has been delivered for delegates of COP26. Could the Scottish Government do the same for the people of Scotland so that more people can use public transport rather than cars? So I think that is a, an excellent and uh, very justified question. As my answer to uh, the previous question demonstrates, we are not just recognising the importance of accessible public transport to get people out of cars and to reduce transport emissions, we have to do that in action. So the uh, commitment that we have made and are delivering in uh, the next few months to uh, make bus travel free for young people is an important part of that. But it's only part. We've got further work to do to make public transport a much more accessible option. And that is fundamentally about cost but it's also about the ease and convenience of public transport we've got uh, lots of uh, work and investment into you know making uh, bus infrastructure uh, better so that you know 
using the bus is more convenient. You're not getting stuck in traffic. It's, it's easier to do. So we need to do all of that if we're to make that a reality for people. So there's a lot more we need to do there. And I would not stand here and say it's, it's job done. Going back to the earlier question, decarbonising transport is a big part of what we need to do over this next stage of our journey to net zero. And everything you're talking about there is, is part of that. That then gets to the point about integrated ticketing. Uh, and again, we've got a lot to do on that. Uh, we often talk about the, the Oyster card, which in London, for example, has been a huge success. I actually think there's now probably a need to get beyond the physical card and support much more, which lots of bus companies are already doing, contactless payment. Uh, so uh, there's lots of, of focus on trying to, to find these right solutions. Um, so yeah, there, is, there is work to be done. Uh, the final point I would make in relation to your question, given that you were a, a member of the Climate Assembly, is just to say how valuable that work was. Lots of recommendations, some of them quite challenging for us to deliver, but a real commitment on the part of the government to taking them forward because the value of that exercise was that it, the outcome of it reflects what people uh, across the country think is necessary if, as a, a society, we've to, uh, we're going to live up to the challenge that we, we face right now. So thank you for your role in it. Thank you. And the next question is from Susie Lilly, also of the Scotland's Climate Assembly. Susie is in the front row here. Thank you. You can. Hi, thank you. Scotland has this year shown global leadership by involving people in decision making, having commissioned Scotland's Climate Assembly and tasked us and the Children's Parliament with finding fair and effective solutions to the climate emergency. And we rose to this challenge. This is the first time in global history that children have been involved in decision making about climate change and they did brilliantly. This is also the year Scotland enshrined children's rights into law. I saw that this was overturned recently by the UK, UK Supreme Court. What is the Scottish Government planning to do to rectify this? The time to create a sustainable legacy for children and young people is now. They are Scotland's most valuable resource for a sustainable future. How does the Scottish Government plan to continue to bring children, young people and ordinary citizens into decision making and to protect their rights? Um, thank you very much for that question. Thank you for your uh, contribution to the, the Climate Assembly too. Um, on the uh, decision, the really, really important and very special decision taken unanimously by the Scottish Parliament earlier this year to incorporate into domestic law the United Nations Convention on the Rights of the Child. Um, probably one of the most important things the Scottish Parliament has done in its lifetime. The UK Supreme Court, I'm not criticising the court in any way, shape or form, it's, it's there to do uh, its job independently. Um, it didn't strike down the whole law, it was parts of it that it uh, deemed, in, in summary, uh, they thought were out with the powers of the Scottish Parliament. We deliberately um, took a maximalist view um, and effectively some devolved responsibilities are currently incorporated in UK Acts of Parliament that were passed before the Scottish Parliament was in existence. And uh, we take the view that they are devolved and therefore the UNCRC should apply to those. Uh, for reasons I won't go into all the technicality, the court thought that was out with our powers. Now we're currently considering how we respond to that, how we make sure that we can take forward our commitment in the fullest possible way. I would argue, I'm not going to get into this today because it's not the subject here, um, if our Parliament's powers are too restrictive uh, to properly protect the rights of children, then that tells us we need to increase the powers of our Parliament, not that we need to reduce the protection we give to children. But that's a, a debate uh, for another day. More generally, I think the voices of children and young people uh, across all areas of policy, but particularly in how we tackle the climate crisis, are crucial. Um, you know, ch particularly children today will live with the impact of the climate crisis um, in a way that the rest of us will not. Um, and therefore, uh, we need to listen to their views on what needs to be done. And I think we're doing that successfully in Scotland. Uh, our challenge now is to make sure we act on what children and young people are saying. And that is very much uh, the focus as we uh, take forward the, the various policies designed to meet the targets that we have set. Thank you. And the final question is from Ellie Clark. Another member of the Scot Scotland's Climate Assembly. Is Ellie here? Hello, Ellie. Can you hold a moment while we get the microphone to you? Ellie is just down. She's standing. Thank you. Thank you, First Minister. 
As Climate Assembly members, we were presented very strong evidence that backs our recommendation to immediately require government and public services to procure plant-based and low-carbon foods for all public sector catering and canteens. Implementing this recommendation would have immediate long-term impacts on our health and reduce our greenhouse gas em emissions considerably in Scotland. In recent discussions with MSPs and your ministerial colleagues, I'm aware that government procurement for food guidelines in the catering for change is under review at this moment. Um, First Minister, how can we make this recommendation happen? Well, we are determined to make the recommendation happen, to reflect it in our procurement uh, rules and, and guidance, as we are determined as far as we can to take forward all of the, the recommendations that the Climate Assembly made. Procurement is one of the, procurement policy is really, as you will have found out in the course of the Climate Assembly, is really dry and technical and sometimes seems deadly dull, uh, but it is actually one of the most important tools that government and public sector have to uh, influence and, and shape policy. It's effectively our purchasing power, um, so it's really important we use it to the full. We've, over recent years, tried to use procurement policy to extend the reach of the real living wage, uh, fair work policies, and it's really important we do it to uh, advance policies that protect the climate uh, and the environment as well, and uh, that is really important through the procurement of food uh, to make sure that that's reflected there. So it is an important recommendation. The fact that we're reviewing uh, the guidance right now demonstrates that we want to make sure we do what is necessary to take that forward. So um, I, I do hope that you will see uh, the commitment to that as these reviews take place and guidance is updated in the, the period to come. Thank you very much, First Minister. Everyone, that marks the end of the formal part of today. And before we all leave, I'd like to invite you again to thank the First Minister for setting out the Scottish Government's commitments at the beginning of this very important COP26 conference. Thank you very much, First Minister.